As a producer and a director, Tom Wisnowski thinks of himself as a storyteller first and a juggler second. In addition to telling stories for BuzzFeed's profile and ABC's Good Morning America Weekend, Tom has directed live, live to tape, and pre-recorded programming for ABC, PBS, Discovery, BuzzFeed, Tribune Media, as well as private clients. He's collaborated with Peabody and Emmy Award-winning journalist Bob Woodruff on Focus Earth with Bob Woodruff for Discovery's Planet Green Channel. Tom has directed some amazing events like Victoria's Secret Fashion Shows, Cooking with Bobby Flay and Rocco Despirito, hundreds of celebrity interviews with the likes of Sean Connery, Bruce Willis, and Jennifer Lopez, pregame shows for the New York Mets and the New York Jets, a Super Bowl parade for the New York Giants. He's also adapted and produced live televised scenes from Broadway's 42nd Street, Stomp, Rent, Hairspray, and Little Shop of Horrors. As session trumpet player, Tom's love for music shines, especially in live performances, and he's had the pleasure of producing for the likes of Natalie Cole, Al Jarreau, Chuck Mangione, B.B. King, Andy Williams, Montgomery Gentry, Sammy Hager, and many more. Oh, and about the juggling metaphor? Yeah, that might not be real. But in addition to his busy career as a director, Tom, like Clint Eastwood before him, has also served as mayor of the small town he calls home. How did you get into this this field? What what got you into directing? It's, you know, as we're talking to people, the stories behind some of these careers are just fascinating. Um, whenever anyone asks me that, like anyone young who's just entering the business, I say the last thing you want to do is do it the way I did it. Um, <laughs> I, I actually got into it through through um, being a musician. My um, my my college degree is in music. I'm a trumpet player. I still play. I play actually now probably more than in, ever in the last 30 years I've been. Um, and I was in New York and I was playing. I played some Broadway and some stuff like that. But I was getting into the recording studios a little bit and um, kind of got interested in the technology mm. and was sort of thinking that I kind of like this end of it a little better. And um, then I met a guy who, Eddie, you'll remember, John Sherrard. Sure. John introduced me to the world of television audio, and it wasn't really a big leap from what I was doing in this, my limited engagements in the studio, and I got interested. And um, actually, Eddie, I don't think you know this, but my very first day in a TV control room was the day, the first day that Don King directed Good Morning America. Wow. Yeah, I was there with John, and um, I was in the uh, uh, I was in the back in the audio room. And at the end, you know, I didn't know anything about what was going on. And at the end of the today, um, I said, "John, what's he? What what does he do?" What? And, and John said, "Well, that's the director." And right there in my head, I said, "That's what I want to do." Wow! Yeah! Wow! Yeah. Just because you watched what he did or how he orchestrated or um, what, what, I, what made you say that? That's a really good question. And I'm not completely sure, but I think because it was so similar to conducting an orchestra or a band. And I used to do an awful lot of that as when I was a musician and directing, especially directing live TV is really very similar to that. Multiple sources, multiple instruments, blending, bringing things in, taking things out, wow. um, doing it in real time. Um, that was sort of, I think, what spoke to me. Mm -hmm. so before we move on, let's tell everybody who Don Roy King is. Yes. Don Roy King, um, I'm going to use the word legendary. Yep. Um, legendary New York director. He, um, he first hit the big time years ago directing the Mike Douglas show in Philly. Yeah. Uh, and then moved to New York, and I don't think there's anybody who's ever had a better career than Don. Um, Don directed Good Morning America for a while. I'm not sure how many years. Um, he directed the CBS early show, but most recently, Don just retired after, I think it was 12 years, is that right? Directing Saturday Night Live. Yep. Mm -hmm. um, I tease him about he's had to reinforce his bookshelves because he's had so many Emmy Awards, um, probably more than all the rest of us combined. And to top top it all off, Don's a really nice guy. And with me, he's always been very, very generous with his time and his encouragement and, and 
all that kind of stuff. So that's that's who Don is. And, and Don's a lot more than that, but that's a nutshell. <laughs> it's interesting how you said when you were observing him from the audio booth, how you liked him because he was like a conductor. Yes. And, and I've been in TV for 40 years, and yeah. Don was the first director I ever saw directing standing up. Everybody mm -hmm. used to sit down, and mm -hmm. it was a casual take one, take two, do this and that. And he would he would stand up in that. Well, he really handled things very much in in, in my terms, very musically, you know. Mm -hmm. um, and that's probably one of the things that appealed to me too. Even though I didn't have any idea what was going on, there was something about it that that I that I picked up on. I've sort of tried to emulate that in 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 my work in my career, to you know to. You know, sometimes successfully, sometimes less than, but that's the nature of the beast. <laughs> Well, and I think it's a really beautiful visual for, you know, what takes place behind the scenes. And I've been very fortunate to be behind the scenes and in the audience several times in Good Morning America and lots mm -hmm. of other shows. And what I, I see the same thing when it's a really well run show then everybody moves and flows through their cues and the and you know the props and the in and out and the going live and and all those things happen with such grace when there's a then when there's a crew that trusts each other knows what they're doing has the big picture and i love that sense cuz you can definitely tell what studios work well together and what ones yeah don't as well that I agree with you completely. It's a ballet. Yeah. Um, and, uh, and you're absolutely right. And um, Good Morning America, I think, is, a, is maybe the number one example of an organization that, that works well together. And that really comes from the top, I believe. Um, I believe that the producers and the, and the director set that tone. And, and that's true in all walks of life, whether it's television or, or corporate America or whatever, you know, mm -hmm. the 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 work ethic and the, the morale really do flow down from the top. Um, mm -hmm. Lily, who directs Good Morning America now, is a tremendous leader, you know, um, and uh, and I think that she really inspires her, you know, her crew to uh, to do a good job. And uh, um, there there from time to time have been people in in that chair that maybe haven't been quite as quite as good leaders and sometimes that shows you know and i, I you know you, there, there are many millions of stories in in all directions that way but you're i agree so now you've also besides good morning america you have done so many directing uh ballets as it were mm -hmm. and many broadway things many you know musical pieces sporting events you know up to the super bowl i mean you have you, you kind of cover everything uh so what you know what makes you interested in having so much diversity in what you do because it can't be easy direct most directors hard very very few the, the the people that get to direct shows like good morning america and talk shows and those kinds of things and the, the big entertainment specials that's rarefied air you know most people don't get to to live in that stratosphere you know mm -hmm. it's just you know people who get to work on those shows that's also rarefied air eddie's been living in that in that upper zone for 40 years you know most mm -hmm. people don't get the chance to do that most people i'm going to speak for directors most directors make their bread and butter directing newscasts and it's mostly local newscasts and there was nothing more boring than your your 5000th newscast that was exactly the same as number 4999 yeah. just with different words um and i just didn't want to get into that rut mm -hmm. um I, 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 I've been really, really fortunate to just to have some opportunities. But one of the keys that I learned, I might have learned this from Don. I'm not sure, but I just never say no. Mm -hmm. I never say no. Um, I'll, you know, if an idea comes my way, the very first thing out of my mouth is, yeah, tell me more. <laughs> and sometimes that doesn't work out, but sometimes it does. And it, it um, I was a staff director at, for about 20 years at WPIX in New York. And I was always the first one in line to do the specials. You know, um, if if there was something extra, I'll do it. Mm -hmm. First of all, just to get out of the tedium of the day-to-day -day stuff. But also <laughs> that kind of stuff really interests me. The, you know, live television is, 
um, is an environment really unlike no other. And I didn't understand it. It didn't really register with me until one day there was, we had a, a movie star on, he was doing an interview with one of our hosts. And afterwards he asked if he could sit in a, next to me and observe in the control room for a while. I said, of course wow. you can. So he came in and after about 20 minutes, we went to a, com to a commercial break or something. And he just looked at me and said, my God, you're editing a movie on the fly here. Yeah. yeah. And I never yeah. really thought about it that way. So anyway, that's a really roundabout way of saying that I just like the variety. I like the, you know, doing different things. And I like that you kind of picked up on that because mm -hmm. um, I always wanted to be the kind of guy that I could get plunked into any situation and, and be able to handle it. Yeah. So I, I love how you said that you always say yes and you're always willing for new opportunities. And I sent out, and we have a private Facebook group with TV2, GMA, and I mentioned what we're doing. And you were like the first person say, yes, if you need me, I'll do it. And that's my mentality also, because I've been a freelancer. Even though I'm at GMA for 35 years, I'm technically a freelancer. And, yeah. and basically, you say yes to all opportunities. And what I found is I, I'll say yes, I'll do it once if I love it. I'll be available to do more. I, exactly. I love it. It was an experience and that's it. Thank you. I don't need to do it anymore. And um, I tell a lot of younger people that are starting out and then anybody who's watching this, this chat right now. Yes, yes, yes. If it's professional, yeah. you're always saying yes. You know, morally, I'm a father. I have, I have three daughters and a son and there is a no morally, <laughs> but professionally. Yes, yes, yes. Um, I go back to the days of pagers, you know, before cell phones. And yeah. they used to buzz me and I used to hop on a phone and yes, yes, yes. Mm -hmm. And I think in another interview, I told Michael, if you can't make it, well, then have a list of two or three other people that you could pass on to because then you make it easier for that booker or whoever's trying to hire somebody and, and even if that person does a, a great job, chances are they'll call you back because you were kind enough to help them. I, I absolutely agree. And as, as we all know, as you get all further advanced in your career, you build up a pretty good network of yeah. people that you can send around. And, you know, other directors have done that for me. I've done that for other directors. Directors are often, you know, we're kind of lone wolves in a lot of way. We don't, you don't work with another director. There's one director on a project and that's right. it. But you still get to be friends and you know who who you can trust and who maybe it might be better for you to not send on a, on a job in place of you you know that's all part of the uh aware your awareness but um but but that's exactly right eddie you, you you know you try and be as accommodating and helpful and available and easy to work with as possible which is uh, kind of almost proof too of your story you know here's you know this this famous actor in for you know promoting their book or their movie and said hey can I sit down with you for just watch what you do yeah and kind of that respect of saying I want to see what goes on behind how you put this together what you do and then that awareness of wow this is not an easy job that you do that <laughs> also I think just kind of adds credibility to what professionalism really means in media Oh, I agree. And the, 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 what we're seeing now, um, with the, with the advent of the iPhone, mm -hmm. um, everybody all of a sudden thinks they're a media professional. <laughs> everybody thinks they're a director and everybody thinks they're a movie star or yeah. a TV star. What do you mean? Of course I am. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I'm a director. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Um, Ask my entourage. It's my cat. Go uh, on. Yeah, well, yeah. My wife Ellen is in the other room, and she's my she's my fan club. <laughs> um, but um, there will always be room for pros at the top of the field. There will mm -hmm. always be that need because um, after a little while, watching bad video and listening to bad audio and watching bad on camera talent is really exhausting and not very satisfying yeah so um the, you know the iphones have opened up a world of opportunity i've shot things on iphones you know i've shot demos for shows sizzle reels and stuff on my iphone on this very phone yeah. um and but um that's the exception and there's a you know so 
uh, a lot of folks just don't realize what all goes into it. For sure. Well, and that's and that's a little bit of you know what we're doing with this whole conference, and this is really fun. It's actually part of a, another element to the business where we're trying to help people that are media professionals find more people that will make credible and reputable guests that they can yeah. count on. But you know this the the people that are watching you know this conference when we go live with it. Uh, when we release it, you know, the question is, how do I make myself a better guest? How do mm. I, you know, how do I leave a positive impression? How do I make sure that I'm newsworthy as one component of it? But, you know, really when it gets down to the point where you're in studio and you've been invited in or you're getting, you know, a remote feed, uh, um, you know, how do you really stand out so that people like you say, hey, that person not only, you know, had great information, but I'd work with them again in a heartbeat because of X, Y, Z, you know, what you you've had to have seen it all some good, bad and ugly. What, you know, what are the first things that pop to your mind of how does somebody really stand out and impress me? Um, there are about a million things that popped into my mind. I've been, been thinking about this, obviously. Uh, um, at, first of all, as a director, um, directors are not really in the content world. Like the message, that's really not our responsibility. Mm -hmm. um, so there's the obvious answer of you have to be an expert in whatever it is you're talking about and all, and, and all of that. That's not really my area. Uh, that's, that's a producer's area. However, um, a director does have some pretty direct editorial control, especially in a live situation um, yes. that, that might be... Um, might not be obvious to the to the untrained eye. For example, let's say it's a it's a panel discussion and there's a host and there's two guests and they're talking about some important news worthy thing. The director gets to make the decision who's on TV when. Yeah. Um, and whoever is on TV at any particular moment sort of has more favored status than anyone else who's there. True. Um, so if there's if if there's two panelists and one of the I'm sorry, I, I don't mean we want to get too long and wordy here, but there's two panelists and one of them knows their stuff and the other one doesn't. Chances are you're going to see the one that knows their stuff more. Mm -hmm. um, so um, being prepared and knowing your message and having something to say, um, while it's not really my area, it kind of really affects my area. You right. know, so. I know you'll probably deal with that with a lot of your other experts about being on message, keeping on point, being concise and all that sort of stuff. Um, but from, from a director's end of things, it also matters to me too. Um, right. So it's not just a producer content thing. However, that all that aside, I think that a lot of it is, a, a lot of it is really just kind of basics, but a lot of people forget the basics. Um, and the basics are show up on time, yeah, or early, <laughs> or early. But you yes. know, whatever your version of on time is, you know, some right. people some people believe that on time is fifteen minutes or a half hour early. Um, um, be cooperative, um, come prepared. I would always advise anyone who's going to be on TV to have some, especially women, to come in some kind of at least a foundation makeup sort of thing. Now, if mm -hmm. you're on Good Morning America or The Day Show or something like that, you're probably going to get drug into the makeup room and someone's going to touch you up. But if you're on a local station, chances are that's not going to happen. True. It's very unlikely that that would happen. In fact, most local stations um, don't have makeup people at all. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, sure. I am my own makeup person. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Well, I am too. And you yes. can see that that hasn't worked out so well. <laughs> yeah, but, but that's an excellent point. But you got to take care of yourself. Um, you've got to make sure that you look good, that you sound good, that you feel good. I'd advise against going to a morning show hungover. Um, <laughs> you know? How about um, as a stage manager? Yeah, well, or as a director. I mean, there always have been times, but um, that's a whole different thing. <laughs> um, that's a really good point, though. No, don't stay I, up too late the night before and don't don't uh, imbibe too much. The, the, the thing that people forget, I think, is that every pixel, while you're on TV, every pixel says something about you and about whatever the thing is that you're representing. 
every one and zero of that digital audio does the same thing. Every instant of it is crucially important. Um, that's why movies take so much painstaking time with continuity. Um, and that's why any good director or any good stage manager takes a lot of time and looks around, um, making sure everything is right. Because yeah. um, I, I, a quick Roger Goodman story, if you don't mind, Eddie. Um, I, as, as Eddie knows, I was um, asked to direct a show for ABC called Focus Earth with Bob Woodruff. Mm -hmm. um, and I was sparing all the long details. We were, the set was about done and I was checking some camera positions and I took some, just took some shots and put together a quick reel that I gave to Roger Goodman, who was the senior director at ABC. Yeah. And I was sort of ahead of schedule and I was feeling pretty good about it. And the set was still under construction. So there was some stuff in the background. Well, the phone call I got was, how dare you send me a reel with all that junk in the background? You oh know, boy. and Eddie, you could have heard you. I'm sure you could hear that conversation. Um, <laughs> and but I learned something from that. And, and what I learned was I have to be a little more particular about what I send out, because everything, every little thing tells a story and it relates to your your persona and your message. So make sure your hair is in place. You know, um, you know, if you walk in and you're like this, I mean. <laughs> That says oh. something about you, and it might cheapen your message. If you're right. a product, if you're a spokesman for a product, and you, and you walk in and you know and you're not right, that says something about the product, and your boss is not going to be happy. Right. So take care of all those details. I, I love everything that you're saying. Let me just add too. As a stage manager, I'm on the floor, and different guests could be celebrities, could be experts, could be you know regular people that are inserted into a story, authors, actors come to the set. And this is a live show. And most of the time we have two and a half minute commercials, sometimes three minute commercials. There are some people that will enter the studio at like one minute to when they're on camera. <gasps> and sometimes <gasps> even like 30 seconds. And what you were saying, Tom, which makes so much sense, you come early. If you could come 15, 20 minutes early, hang out, be relaxed, say hi to people, you know, get your composure, think about what you're going to say. And you have to remember also in live TV, we have a rundown and we know what we're going to go from A to B to C to D. But what happens if B gets canceled or if it's a remote and it goes down or something changes and now the, the producer or director is saying, where are we going to go? And I could say as a stage manager, well, you know, Michael's over here. I could get her onto the set, you know, get her on. So it's good to be early and professional, like you said, and make sure your appearance and everything is good and your composure. So, Oh, that's, that's, I absolutely agree. And building on what you said, um, I think that in most operations, most professional operations, everybody there is there to help you. Mm -hmm. Everybody there wants you to do well. Yep. They want you to look good. They want you to sound good. They try and make you comfortable. That was one of always one of my big things um, directing anything is that I wanted to make sure that I did everything in my power so that whoever whoever my victim is, that, I'm just kidding, whoever, <laughs> whoever I'm working with is comfortable. I just directed um, a few classical concerts this past summer um, in Princeton, New Jersey. Um, and I was working with some opera singers and working with like a Renaissance um, uh, instrumental ensemble. And the very first thing that I said to any of these any of these people was, the most important thing is that you're comfortable and you're so that you can perform at your best. I don't want anything to be in your way. So if there's anything um, that's um, anything that you're not comfortable with, come right to me. You know, let me know, tell me, and we'll fix it. Um, but that said, Eddie, what you, the other half of that is that things, things happen. Yeah. Um, a live television show in particular is this unstoppable juggernaut. It starts at a certain time. It ends at a certain time. And it is one atom away from crashing and burning at any particular moment. And things mm -hmm. change wildly. It's, it's controlled chaos. It's, it, uh, and so... Eddie, what you said is exactly right. As a guest, if you can come in and be flexible, 
Be mm -hmm. there, be ready, but not pushy. Um, your experience is going to be a lot better and your, your chance of getting an ass back is probably a lot higher than someone who comes in sort of like a diva and de mm -hmm. demanding and all that sort of thing. So, Which is interesting that you talk about, you know, you guys, and I, I totally get this. You want to make the guests feel really comfortable. Mm -hmm. From my perspective, every time I've done live interviews uh, with media, I've always tried to make sure that I am making the director, the producer, the whoever's interviewing me, I want them to be comfortable, not because I don't think they're going to be comfortable. I want them to know that I can go at a moment's notice. Mm -hmm. So, you know, when I'm on with the control, if I'm doing it from my house instead of, you know, in the studio and I'm talking to the, you know, the directors that are, you know, going along the same line and they're telling me, hey, we might speed this up. We might have to shorten it. I'm like, no problem. Just tell me what you need. Yep. Give, me, give me the notice when you need me to stop talking. Otherwise, I've got it down to the timing because that way I can prove that my what's important to me is make sure that your part of the, the process can go through. I don't want to over talk. I don't want to cut things off. I just want to make sure that I'm meeting your objectives mm -hmm. from a live on air interview perspective. Well, Michael, I think that's one of the most important things that a, a pr prospective guest um, can do. Um, is to just be accommodating. Um, it's and 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 also just to don't not don't take anything personally. Right. You Absolutely. Know? Um, people are generally not going to be cutting you off just because just for fun. Right. You know. Um, Unless you really suck. <laughs> well, but but if you but but that's true. You know, if you're that's terrible. True. First of all, you shouldn't be there if you're terrible. And, you, exactly. and there are some people who just are not cut out to do that sort of thing. But if you're terrible, that's exactly right. You're going to get a lot less time, but you're, it's not anyone in the TV crew's fault that you're terrible. Right, exactly. You know? It's your own fault yeah. for not recognizing that you shouldn't be on TV in the first place. Right. So there's a little bit of re, you know reality that goes there too. You know, not everyone is talkative. Not everyone is personable. People have different skills. And to your point too, sometimes breaking news, it's not, it's, you know, it's not a, um, something against you. If all of a sudden you're getting interviewed and breaking news comes through, that can take precedence. So that, and that flexibility is really, really critical. I would say more than can take precedent. It always does take oh, precedent. Yeah. Exactly. Always does. And, you know, I have been in, in situations countless of times, as has Eddie, where you, know, you got a whole two or three hours of stuff planned. And in the first half hour, some, you know, something halfway around the world explodes and all of that is gone. And that means yeah. a whole day's worth of guests who, all, who most of them probably showed up because they were probably en route before producers could get to them, had come yeah. to the studio for nothing. There, there's just so much that can go wrong. It's amazing that anything actually goes right sometimes. So, <laughs> so but, but it's not, but it's none of it's personal. You right. Know? Um, and so if, true. as a guest, if you're going to, if you take it personally, then you should be in a different line of work. I know what a director does, right? You know what a director does, but let, let's just share with our audience some things. A director directs cameras, right? You mm -hmm. what we physically see. And then at times the director comes on the floor and directs the talent too, right? Depending on the type of show. So give us a little, you know, a little talk about how you direct both camera and talent. Um it's a it's a it's 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 a much larger um picture than just like on the day of show. Um as far as a director's responsibility, what I usually tell people is that I'm that as a director, I'm responsible for everything except the content. Mm -hmm. um, uh, so as a, the director is is the one who answers for the look of the show, the pacing of the show, mm -hmm. the feeling of the show. A lot of times the directors are integrally, integrally involved in like the scenic design and the lighting design. Um, if If someone's lighting is off, Chan nine times out of 10, the producer or the executive producer is going to come to the director and say, what was wrong? What happened? You're right. You know? Yep. Um, so the more knowledge of all those different areas that someone has, that a director has, the better a director they'll be. Right. Because at the beginning of the day, and let's choose like a morning show environment, because that's, you know, what we're both pretty, we're all pretty familiar with. At the beginning of the day, it's really important, for example, to be able to talk to the lighting designer and say, we're doing this, 
we're doing this and I'd like to do this here. I'd like to do that over there. Uh, here's what you need to look out for. You know, here, you know, if there's any, if I have any special requests, then's a really good time um, to bring them up as opposed to right before the segment say, oh, hey, by the way, can I get, <laughs> and, you know, the answer is probably going to be no at that point. Um, so, you, so fostering good professional working relationships with everybody is really important. But Eddie, you mentioned talent in particular, and that can be the hardest of all. The director talent relationship is one of trust. Mm -hmm. um, and that's the number one, the number one thing, the director, the, you know, the on-air people need to know that the director is looking out for them. Right. Um, so they need to know that the director is not going to do anything to embarrass them. Yeah. Because especially at the network level and even, even at the, the higher end local level, um, the, their image, their on-air persona is, is critically important to the success of the show and yeah. their comfort level critically important to the success of the show. So, um, and that, and, and those relationships build up over time. There's no, there's no way to rush it, but it's something that's worth working working on really hard. And I've been kind of proud in in my career that um, the people who've been my hosts and my anchors um, have felt really comfortable with me. I communicate with them. We work out our own little shorthands so that so that I don't have if I have to talk to them in their earpiece. Mm -hmm. um, first of all, if they hear my voice, they know that it's important because. I only, I'm, I'm trying to be very efficient with that and not, you know, because they're doing their job, you know, but if they hear me, they know they have to pay attention, but you learn little shortcuts and, and abbreviations for things. Um, and uh, it, it's all trust. And once, once an on-air person trusts you, they'll do anything you ask them to do, as long as you ask them nicely. Um, almost anything. <laughs> wait, wait, did you ask Whit Johnson to do the worm in that? Um... <laughs> <laughs> um, I no, we never said that was on regular, you know, Monday through Friday, but GMA, but <laughs> yeah, no, no, but um, it was very impressive. If I had worked with him long enough, he, and I asked him to do that, he probably would. I've had some I people do. Him. I had Dick Clark walk into the studio once with with a with a, a twenty foot thing of toilet paper taped to his heel. He was a spokesman for Charmin. <laughs> And that's how we walked him in with a camera behind him with his big piece of toilet paper stuff. You know, that's that's trust. That is trust. You know? That is trust. You know? That is. <laughs> it's also Dick Clark being Dick Clark in a good sport. Eddie, you know, you work with him. You know, he was a he was great. But um, so working with talent is all about trust. You have to know what you're doing, you know, yeah. uh, and you have to understand that um, there are things that are important to an on air person that aren't necessarily important to regular human beings um, uh, and you have to respect that so that's, that's how you work with talent and that's sort of the, the the key for a director who's working with anybody everybody's job in a television um environment is very specialized people who are who are doing it generally have been doing it for a very long time and are generally experts at it mm -hmm. um and if someone comes along that they don't know or don't trust and is demanding and insistent um, that usually doesn't go so well. I learned that early in my career, you know, that that's not the way to approach things. Um, so respect. I, I just finished reading a book about Harry Truman, the president, Harry Truman, David mm -hmm. McCullough's book. And he had a way of just commanding respect without being commanding, you know, and that's why history sees him as a pretty successful president. Um, mm -hmm. like he wasn't that. an order barker. He was a strong leader. And, you know, I don't want to liken the job of directing a TV show to the job of president of the United States, but it's all about leadership. And, and, and the other aspect of it is, and Eddie, you know this more than anybody, is um, like a calm confidence. Yes. Um, mm -hmm. Because when things get rough, the director's voice is the one that matters. Yeah. Um, and so you really have to know your stuff. Um, you have to know your people. You have to know the limitations. Uh, and then you got to be calm and cool and collected about it all. Tom, I mean, everything you're saying is fabulous. And I really mm -hmm. appreciate you coming here. It's really wonderful. I like the idea 
that you said as a director, you have talent has to trust you and you have to develop this rapport. As a stage manager, I'm on the floor, so I see everything, right? And you right. Just see through the camera lens. So whatever the camera's showing you, that's what you see. Right. There are many times, especially nowadays, you were talking about cell phones, that when one talent's on at the desk, the other two are, are on their cell phone, right. whatever they're doing, right? Mm -hmm. And as a director, there might be a time where you need to do a wide shot, but you don't want to make them looking bad that they're not mm -hmm. paying attention or they're looking down. So you have to instantly decide, how am I going to work around this not to make my talent look bad? In uh, yeah, in a case like that, for example, um, I would, you know, if I knew I was coming to a wide shot and we're going to see everybody and three out of the four are, are looking down at their, their phones doing their social media thing, I would just get in their ear like a second or two before and I would just go on cam. That's all I'd say. And they would know. <laughs> and because it's my voice, yep. you know, yeah. assuming you know, I had a relationship with them, up. they would know what that meant. Yep. And they would they would just instantly, and you, you know how it goes, Eddie, they would just instantly and look. <laughs> camera ready you know and the second we were off trained i love it but and, that's a yeah. great example of yeah. not embarrassing somebody and on another note as a as a director you were saying if you're doing an interview with two experts and a host mm -hmm. and you know you are the one who selects and you're the one that that puts the person on camera but there are times it's called cutaways right or reaction shots where even though this person's talking, you might cut away or do a reaction shot of the other person. So as an on-air person, you should always be paying attention. You should always be in the moment because you mm -hmm. never know what the director is going to do in that, in that. Oh, true. That's, that's really true. And actually one of the things that I do, like to do and is, has sort of become a kind of a little signature of mine is I really favor reaction shots hmm. because um, if the two of you are arguing and Michael, you're saying something that Eddie doesn't agree with the, um, the <laughs> shot of Eddie scowling says much more than the shot of you saying, you know, saying what you're saying than the statement. So true. Um, yeah. and actually, you know what, you bring up another really good point and we all know that people have been caught like this and embarrassed by it. Oh, yeah. I would recommend that anyone who's on TV, as soon as this microphone gets clipped on, yeah. you're on TV. Right. Oh, yeah. Whether or not you're on TV, you right. could be on TV. Right. Um, yes. As long as that thing is on you, yeah. you know, be aware. And as particularly on air, regular hosts have a problem with this sometimes because they get so accustomed to it. You know, yeah. I can't tell you the number of times I've heard toilet flushing on the air, <laughs> you know. <laughs> I know. <laughs> or worse, I know. You know, um, and we all have seen there. You know, those things make it in the media all the time. Something that someone yeah. says off camera that, for whatever reason, the mic was open, and people who host television shows, you know, the really experienced anchors. I mean, that's just part of their. Yeah. That's part of what they do. That's you know, that's part of what makes a good one good. Yeah. Um, well, I know we've we have like pulled so much information out of you, um, but I wanted to hit one more point too because sure. you were talking earlier about you know understanding the trust that's built and especially between the directors and the anchors, but also the trust with everyone, the stage managers, the prop people, the lighting uh, people, the audio people. There's so much trust, and there's so much experience. And the one thing that I remember realizing long ago, I think in the first year or so that I was doing media 20 some years ago interviews um, that I realized when I walked into that studio, I was nervous in the beginning because I wasn't quite used to it. But the moment I just watched how everybody else operated, I remember number one, it wasn't about me anymore, even mm -hmm. though I was there to be, you know, the expert. But number two, if you really just trust that everybody else knows what they're doing and wants to make you look good because that makes the show look good, then it it takes some of the anxiety down, especially when people aren't used to doing media or they haven't done it live and in person in a studio for a while. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I agree. And uh, especially as a, as a new person, um, no one wants a shrinking violet on TV. Um, but that's a, those are those are really important lessons that you, you sort of step back a little bit, let everyone do their thing. Um, it's going to be okay, you know. Mm -hmm. um, 
I don't know that there's anyone better, for example, at holding someone's hand than Eddie. You know, I mean, he's been doing it for such a long time. Mm-hmm. Um, and, you know, all the stage managers, GMA and all the big shows, you know, they're, you know, if they see that you're a little nervous or something like that, they'll take care of you. But you're yeah. right. Trust. Let let people do their jobs. Um, I always think about um, musical acts. And Eddie, you've seen this firsthand. I know you have. Mm-hmm. Um, the difference between experienced acts and young acts. Mm-hmm. Um, the experienced acts, they come in, they set up, they plug in, they do a quick sound check. Yeah, everything's fine. The inexperienced acts, oh my my goodness, they can um, they can drive you crazy. I need I need one decibel more of the bass in this monitor. And wow, 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 come on, you know this is a live TV show. We have we have three minutes to do this um, because they don't trust the process. Right. Um, right. So trusting the process, trusting the people, uh, it, it's it's really really important. Um, uh-huh. I so agree. Tom, you have just, thank you for not only all your incredibly valuable information, but also some very fun stories. And, you know, a little look back about how you got to this point. And maybe it's not the uh, direction you say anybody else should take to become a director. But I think it's really important that people understand that careers take a lot of different directions. And uh, sometimes when you don't know what you're looking for, it may be right in front of you. You just have to look up and look through a different lens. (laughs) <laughs> or a different camera. Yeah. Ah, I, I see what you did there. Yeah. <laughs> you <wanna do> that? <laughs> yeah, you're right about that. Um, you know, I got out of college and I was convinced I wanted to be a trumpet player for a living, you know? Mm-hmm. Um, and then that just changed. Mm-hmm. And it's interesting now that I'm playing a lot. I get to play with a lot of young musicians, which is really cool. A lot of musicians who are just like finishing college and they're, a lot of them are having the same questions that I have. And I've had some really good conversations with some of these young guys and girls about, um, you know, you can still be in the arts, you can still love it, but you don't have to kill yourself by trying to make a living at it. Yeah. You know, I mean, there are, you, you're, so what you just said is absolutely right. Just look up, open your eyes a little bit more, look around. And even if you're not open to something or if you don't think you want something new, something new might just come and splat you right between the eyes. <laughs> Hopefully it'll not knock you over and you can get yourself back up again. (laughs) Hopefully. Yeah. Hopefully it doesn't cause permanent damage. Yeah. 